Hey gang, I am Joe Wettelman and welcome to The Last Frame Live. Tonight, we're gonna continue the journey through the hows and whys through my gear, and it's gonna be part two of our color management conversation, which my intention, just so you're forewarned, is really to do some Q&A and actually to give you a whole bunch of warnings. So sit tight. Uh, I do have just a tiny little bit of industry news, and I promise to do a Q&A before we wrap up. So start typing. I'll do my best to answer all of your questions in the next 60 minutes. And of course, if you're watching the replay, there will be chapters listed below the description or below in the description so that you can go ahead and jump ahead to the sections of the show that interest you the most. And if you're here for the replay, no worries. Please drop me a comment below the video so that I know you are here. Those of you that are watching live, you've already started. I appreciate it. Leave me a little note in the chat. Let me know who you are and where you are in the world already. I got Cooley here. Joe's here from California. Joe, I have a special news item for you tonight. I got Alan in Denmark. Ron is here all the way from Thursday in Australia. David in San Diego. Lynn in New York. I got Robert down in New Mexico. Uh, let's see. FN89 is down in Florida. There we go. Mike up in Montreal. I, Montreal? Canada. Anyway, hey, listen, all of you, thank you. Peter in England. Marcos in Chile. Gosh, I got picture effects in Germany. We got people here from all over the place. So awesome. All of you, part of a growing global community of photographers in over 100 countries who tune in to watch The Last Frame every week. And for that, I'm going to work really hard to help you with your photography in the next 60 minutes. It, of course, would help a lot more people find out about The Last Frame. If you could do me a quick solid, hit the thumbs up below the video, right, 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 right down there. Yep, okay. Of course, the more thumbs up, the more that YouTube will recommend the show to other photographers so that we can get the word out. And of course, while you're down there, feel free to hit that share button. I just put the link in the chat, or you can hit that share button, but let your photography friends know that we are streaming live on YouTube. Facebook, Twitter, they're usually the fastest way to get the word out. So just a couple reminders, I'm not going to bore you with screenshots tonight. Coming up after the first of the year, Imaging USA, January. You don't want to miss it. I'm going to be teaching two hands-on pre-con classes, and I'll be doing a platform talk that is all about color, color theory. Imaging USA, probably one of the best, if not hands down, the best photography event in the United States. So don't miss it. And then in April, Texas School. Really cool event. I've been looking forward to teaching for Texas School for quite a few years. It is a week-long event, and you spend a full week with one instructor. So that's right. If you think that you can hang with me for a full week, that's the place you want to be. Dallas, Texas, it's the third week in April. Again, link is in the description below. So listen, originally, I was going to skip on news tonight because I was kind of like, oh, there's not a lot, a whole lot going on. But I'll be honest, I was just busy this week, and I haven't really been keeping up with the news headlines and so I was just checking out Petapixel before we came live, and I thought, well, there's a couple items here that I think it's kind of important that we mention. Because, you know, the last couple of weeks I talked about the new cameras from Sony and from Canon. So for the, like, one Pentax user that's, you know, watching my show right now, Pentax has announced a new camera, the KFD SLR, which, according to the first sentence in Petapixel, it is basically the same camera that they released in 2016, right? So I don't know how that works out. But anyway, there's a new Pentax coming. And yes, it is a DSLR. Kind of like Olympus went all in on Micro Four Thirds and refuses to consider full frame. And I'm not saying they should. Sorry, I, I didn't want that to come out the wrong way. Uh, Pentax has gone all in on DSLRs. And you know what? I actually think in the long run, that may work out for them. Time will tell. Who knows? I mean, I'm certainly a believer in switching over to the dark side and working with all mirrorless, but what's to say that there's not a market, right? We shall see. Uh, also, I just found this one kind of humorous. Canon, uh, they decided to go with a $5 a month subscription fee for their webcam software. And you get a couple bonus features in it, like you can do multicam and stuff like that. I figure they're probably trying to follow in the footsteps of Elon Musk by charging for something that nobody wants or nobody needs because there's a whole bunch of better options out there than that software, right? I mean, there just are, right? So seriously, that's the news for the week, okay? 
and we got part two. Part two of color management, what is it, the tools that I use. So I still have two tools that I wanna give you a breakdown of, but before that, let's just go back to the beginning briefly for those of you that maybe weren't here last week and who are kind of picking up on this conversation in the middle and also to give me an opportunity to step back a half a step and throw a couple more warnings out there because I've gotten a lot of questions this week. Actually, a lot of really good questions about this color management stuff. But at the same time, I realized that I may have inadvertently just kind of added to some of the confusion last week by not giving enough warnings. So remember, when we're talking about color management, there, as a photographer gang, there are lots of layers to how we deal with color, right? We've got uh, the color management of our devices. There's color profiles. There's color spaces. There's all kinds of places where we are managing color, so to speak. But generally, when we hear the phrase color management, what, what exactly is that, right? So generally, color management is referencing your devices, your computers, your monitors, your printers, even your eye devices to some degree, okay? So color management is the process of controlling the way the colors are represented across various devices. And, and by the way, I should add, not necessarily just your devices, but any device that will view your image, meaning devices where you actually don't have a lot of control, but you still want your stuff to look good. Hopefully that kind of tips you off as to maybe why this is actually really important, right? So there are a whole litany of reasons why color management is important, but basically we can drill it down to kind of one fairly simple statement. It's because you want to be able to make sure that your colors are exactly the way you want them when people view them. Now, please notice what was missing in my statement. What was missing was the word correct. We're not talking about correct color. We're talking about color the way that you want it to be. And, and why is that? Well, number one, because it's almost impossible from a practical standpoint, right? We're, we're in that territory where every statement I make, we could also argue the complete opposite and not be wrong if we're going strictly by science, okay? So I am going to be speaking from a practical standpoint, all of this. From a practical standpoint, what really is correct color? If I walk outside tomorrow and it's supposed to be sunny here, and we're at that time, I'm in Pennsylvania, the leaves are falling, the colors are in the trees are very bright, there's color, colorful leaves in the ground, and the grass is kind of that in-between. You know, it's not the lush, summery or spring green, but it's still green. So I take a picture, but I love color. I love colors that are bold and bright and intense. So if I want to enhance that green a little bit, which I likely would, as far as I'm concerned, that is the correct color because I want it to be that slightly more saturated green. So does that make it correct or incorrect? It makes it correct because that is what my intent is. When you're photographing people, when you're photographing landscapes, when you're photographing almost anything, when it comes to this conversation of color management, one of the things that you have to ask yourself is, what is correct and how important is that correct? If I'm photographing a product, the image is going to appear uh, on Amazon or on a website and the color of that product, maybe it's a shirt, is part of the sales piece of that, then it is important that the color is as accurate to the actual original item as possible. So that's a scenario where we're adding another layer in, 
right? So one of the things, I said this last week and a few people commented on it and, and actually thanked me for saying it, but I wanna say it again, I can't stress it enough. These four tools that I'm gonna show you, two of which we went through last week, most of you don't need all four of them. Most of you actually only need one of them or something similar if you don't wanna use the brand that I use and that is the Spider, which is the calibration calibration tool for your monitors, your displays, right? That is something that you should all be doing if you care about, ready? Consistency in your work, meaning what you see when you work on the picture on your computer is what people will see when they review your work on the internet. And that of course is to the degree that we can control that because we can't control it completely, right? So that is the challenge here. That's the one piece out of the four that I would encourage all of you. And, and look, if you don't have the money to go out and buy it today, that's fine, save your pennies. But that's something that you should be prioritizing, right? Look, one of the challenges with all of this gear conversation stuff we're having, you know, we're talking about cameras, we talk about lenses, we talk about lighting. You know, I, I could help you spend thousands and thousands of dollars in the 20s, 30s, and 40s, right? But who has that? I don't even have that. Not to go just spend on gear because it would be cool to have. So you have to prioritize. So that's part of the conversation here. A lot of these tools, for instance, even like, the Spider Checker Photo, which I showed you last week, which of course has the color charts and that in it. Very valuable tool, but most of you don't actually need this. And I'm gonna show you a good argument why you don't need it. And then again, why you might need it in just a minute, okay? Trust me, you'll understand. So again, please don't get gassed because of this. Don't run out and buy this stuff. Understand that each one of these things that you use adds to your workflow, right? So each one of these things, if you're going to use it properly, you need to read the doggone directions. Each one of these things, if you're gonna buy it and use it, you need to actually learn how to use it. And before you buy it, you should be able to answer a fairly simple question. What kind of impact is it actually going to have on my photography? Just because Joe Edelman said he has one, doesn't mean that it's going to have a positive impact on your photography, right? So that being said, we talked about the color calibrator for your devices. Very, very important. Uh, somebody left me a question on um, YouTube, actually on last week's video, but I just saw it today before I came live is, what if you're trying to calibrate iPads? So I don't have a definitive answer, but I'll tell you what I believe, and I'm gonna research this because somebody else had mentioned iPads earlier this week. And then I saw this question, I thought, all right, let's talk about this. I went online, I did a whole bunch of Googling, I did some research, here's what I found. Back in the uh, like 2010s, 2011, data color in the early versions of the Spider, they boasted that you could create a color profile for an iPad. And then all of that information about creating color profiles for iPads kind of went dark. Um, the newer versions, specifically like this one, the Pro and the Elite, make no mention of working with iPads at all. So I have drafted an email that I sent off to my contacts at Datacolor to get a definitive answer because I thought, you know, now that we have the ability to use iPads, if you're a Mac user, you have the ability to use iPads as um, an extended display and control it from your Mac would the color calibration work? So I did not have the time to go all the way through, but here is my belief, and I'm gonna get you the definitive answer for next week. My belief is if you're on an M1 Mac and you're using an M1 or M2 iPad Pro, I believe you can color, brow, color calibrate it with the current software. We'll see but from what I could tell, it will work. And the reason why I say I believe you can do that is because you the, the way the profile works on the M1 Max, it doesn't actually create a new color profile, it lays over top of the one that Apple has. So the two of them work together. 
So you don't have to be on a device where you can actually replace the color profile. That's how the M1s work. So for those of you that are Apple people, maybe you also want to color correct um, an iPad, which think about it, somebody better get their act together, whether it's that a color or whomever, because now, especially with Capture One and their iPad software, there's going to be a lot more photographers adopting that piece of technology. Even if they don't go all in on Capture One, they're going to be using that iPad tethering capability because it's just simply, a, it's a great utility. It's super convenient, right? So it is going to be very, very important. I will tell you probably the most important thing, if you still don't have the money to dive in on color calibration for your, your Mac machines, make sure you're turning off True Tone and Night Shift and all of those aspects because they are going to change the color. So you need to go into your display settings. You need to go into accessibility settings. Turn all that stuff off. You want the brightness and the color scheme to be pretty much raw, and you want it to stay that way all the time. Those are great features, you know, for the things that we hold in our hands to save us from, you know, staying up all night doing death scrolling on TikTok, right? But they are not great features for managing color for photographers. So I'll report back more on the iPad information, but I, I do believe, my hunch is, iPad Pros M1s will work with the current software from Data Color. So we'll find out, okay? So Joe's telling me here, uh, the Spider X is on sale right now on Amazon for $130. So there you go, that's pretty good. So the two pieces that I didn't get to last week, um, and the good part is there's not a whole lot to break down on these, but I promised you I would give you the breakdown and let me just get to their website here so that I can make sure I've got all of the information. Um, we'll start with the easy reader. The first one is the easy reader. And I mentioned this very briefly. There's not a whole lot more to it than what I mentioned last week, right? Most of you, this is not a gadget that you need. It's a $60 item. If you have a use, it's worth every penny of the $60. If you don't have a use, then no, it's completely pointless. So basically what this is, you download a data color app on your phone. You use this item and let's say that uh, we want to be able to get the exact color red on the Coke can. We can then basically scan that color. Connected to the app, it will then give us the hex color, the Pantone colors, uh, it'll give you the CMYK, the RGBs, and it will also help you build out color palettes based around that color. So if you are like me and you do a lot of work that is really intense with color and you are trying to develop color palettes around different things, this can be really handy. If you struggle with color, meaning you know pairing this color and that color, a device like this can be really handy to work real time. So what would be a use case scenario? I'll tell you straight up. Somebody comes into your studio and they've got an outfit and that outfit is some shade of pink, right? And you would like to be able to match that. Even for that matter, you know, um, be able to gel it or work with something that's going to be a complementary color, but you're not sure what, what's going to be the complementary color to that pink. This is going to allow you to actually scan that item, get an RGB set of hex colors or CMYK. You don't really want to work with CMYK. You can work with hex or RGBs. And then it's also going to give you recommendations for color palettes built around that. Without spending $60, remember, you could simply go online and you could go to a website like Canva, um, Google Canva Color Wheel, and you will find for free. You don't, have to, you, don't have to, you don't have to be a Canva user. You don't have to pay for Canva to use this. Canva has a free color wheel online. It's actually one of the better ones. Adobe also has one, but honestly, the Canva one is super simple to use. Now, the difference is it's not going to scan a color for you, right? So, but you can go through and visually, you can pick a color and then it is going to build the color palettes for you based on whether you want it to be, you know, complementary, monochromatic, uh, triadic, all of those options for color palettes. It will build suggestions for you. So there's always a way around that doesn't cost you a lot of money, but for something, for me, 
you know, I tuck this in my camera bag. It's always with me and it has come in handy on more than one occasion. But let's face it, if you're a landscape photographer or, you know, you're doing stuff like that, there's going to be a little to no value in a device like that. So again, I'm not recommending that you all run out and buy it. I'm just letting you know, hey, if you are doing work where you're building color palettes, where specific colors are important to you, it's a great tool, okay? Now, uh, then last item, and again, this is one that I only use occasionally. This is the Spider Cube. Now, what's cool about this is basically you line this up, okay, so that you're seeing equal amounts. And depending on where your light is, of course, it is going to let you know, do you have the proper white balance? Um, are you getting good balance in your exposure, contrast, everything? Because you can then go in and you can sample these points. It also has what's called a black well. I believe they call it a well. Um, so that if you take the image straight on, light generally comes from above, right? So even if you get light reflecting up onto the surface, there is a well in there. There you go. Now you can see it. There's a well in there that's not going to get any light. So when you're looking at that straight on, even if light reflects onto the bottom, that is going to remain pitch black. So you have the ability to measure, you know, 255s across the board RGB or zeros across the board in um, RGB for black to make sure that you're getting the right tonal ranges. I mentioned before, I have a small occasional use case where I use it. I talk routinely about photographing candles for my son and daughter-in-law for their, their side hustle business. The candles are in glass jars and they are uh, soy candles. So of course that means, you know, at first glance, when you look at them, everything's white but they're not. The soy candles actually are uh, slightly kind of a creamy, yellowy color. So when I set up to do the product shots, not their social media images, because when I do their social media images, I actually inflict a little bit of Joe Edelman into them and we use lots of color and, and we get very creative with them. But when we're doing the product shots, I set up and I do a color chart and I will check my ratios from highlights to shadows so that I am making sure that I've got good detail with the goal being to have the glass jars look white and the candle look slightly creamy. And when I say glass jars, I'm sorry, I should say the label on the glass jar, okay? So that kind of stuff is super, super important for product work because it has to be an accurate representation. Now, last week, I didn't lie to you, but I changed my mind. I told you that I would show you the step-by-steps through calibrating my monitors and also uh, creating the uh, color chart profile and measuring it. After I told you that, I stumbled across, of all places, on the Data Color website. I stumbled across a video, and I'm gonna share the link to this video. I'm not gonna play the whole video now, but um, let me just get my mouse back here where it belongs, and I will, there we go. Um, I will share this link for you. On this page, Autumn Schrock does a full walkthrough. And the best part of it is, it's landscape photography, right? So, and I'll tell you why that's important momentarily, but it's a full walkthrough on how she uses the spider checker photo and then takes it into um, the data color software, creates the target preset, and then creates a preset. And she also shows how she calibrates her monitors. So it's both things in one, walks you through everything step-by-step. Step. It's wonderfully done. She does it at a really good pace. So there's no sense in me creating another video about that. But I wanna point out something to all of you, right? And remember, by the way, just to clarify, uh, I'm not being paid by Data Color to talk about this. Uh, I have received some free products from them in the past. I have also bought quite a few of my Data Color products I am a user and would spend money for them, right? Even the ones that were given to me. That being said, I would suggest, in my opinion, that the example that Autumn uses in this video, which is a landscape image, it's a beautiful landscape, uh, scenic type shot with um, um, a lake and blue sky. 
I would suggest that this is the perfect example of why so many of you actually don't need to do that, meaning do the whole color calibration with the chart. And the reason is very simple. When you look at the before and you look at the after on her image, and again, it's a beautiful image. The before is nice. The after is nicer. But then, and I, and I don't think this was really kind of intended to be this way, but she adds one more step. She adds saturation to the colors. So the minute she did that, she basically took this and said, yeah, I want more. Meaning, what is it? It is subjective, right? So, yeah, I'm not a landscape photographer, <laughs> full disclosure. But for me, if I'm shooting landscapes, yeah, look, I don't want to make my stuff look like everything I'm shooting is like, you know, on the surface of Jupiter or something. But at the same time, depending on the day of the week, depending on Mother Nature, depending on the time of the day that I get there, I may want it to look a little cooler than it does. And when I say cooler, I don't mean colder colors. I just mean neater, richer, bolder, more saturated colors. So I'm very likely going to go ahead and saturate those colors. And I may even go into my hue, saturation, and luminance panels in my processing software. Again, that's Adobe Camera Raw. You can do that in Affinity. You can do it in DxO. You can do that in... in um, Skylum, doesn't matter what you're working in. They, they all allow you to work hue, saturation, and luminance, capture one, all of them. I would most likely take my scene into those panels and work on the different colors and saturate them to varying degrees. Generally, just grabbing a saturation slider is not going to get you the kind of results that you want because remember, anytime you do just a saturation slider, you are saturating every color in your shot by the exact same amount. It's kind of like using the exposure sliders and the contrast sliders. They're not your friends. They're shortcuts that generally do not have a good outcome. So for exposure, you know, you're going to use um, highlights and shadows and whites and blacks more than you're going to use contrast or exposure. For color, hue, saturation, and luminance, or vibrance are going to be much more effective for you in getting bright, cold, or bright, bold, and rich colors than using saturation. Using saturation is kind of like in your cameras when you pick the profile that's called Vivid, which you know a lot of brands use that Vivid. And the first time you do it, when you don't know that much about photography, you switch over to Vivid and you take an image, it's like, whoa, that's cool, look at those colors. And then you give it about five minutes and you realize, no, those colors are kind of like burning your retina and they're just really kind of ridiculous. They're just overdone, right? That's what a saturation slider does for you. So uh, so I will point out, which I'm sure Data Color would rather than I don't, but you know, she does this great job of walking through the whole thing and showing you the differences. And then in the end, she just says, well, I'm going to add a little more saturation anyway. Okay, but that's kind of the point. And that's why I would encourage all of you to look at it through that critical lens of, yeah, was there enough difference in working that extra step into the workflow that made it worth it, right? Where a lot of you make a mistake. And when I say a lot of you, I'm speaking from the standpoint of, I made those mistakes. Trust me. I've made all of those mistakes. I've made mistakes that you haven't even dreamed of yet because I've been at it for so long, right? So over the years, especially in the early days of digital photography, I didn't understand color management to the degree that I do now. And even now, I by no means am I an expert, but I've certainly gotten it down to much better workflow and much more consistent workflow. Back in the early days, I made mistakes of not having white balance set properly. Uh, one thing I've, I've told you guys this before, at least I've mentioned this before in several cases, I was a very late adopter to shooting raw. Now, I'm about to steer the conversation off, so bear with me, because this is gonna make a couple people's heads explode, but there's actually value to this. When digital technology came along, I dove in like a lot of photographers did, and I, 
we'll own it. I didn't learn as much as I should have up front. Spent a stupid amount of money. Got the gear. Raw files intimidated me initially because I didn't take the time to learn about them. So there was an unintended consequence. It was kind of a good consequence, right? So yes, I'm talking in both directions. The unintended consequence was I shot JPEGs for the longest while. In fact, it wasn't until 2012 that I switched over completely to shoot just raw. So what was the benefit? So the unintended consequence, the benefit was it forced me to really refine my lighting techniques, my white balance techniques, my color management, and my exposure techniques in digital photography. Then when I switched over to RAW, because I finally took the time to really develop an understanding of RAW and what the potential was, it was like, oh my God, this opens up even more possibilities for me. But the best part of it is today, when my files come out of the camera, they don't need a ton of processing. They all get processed. I, this is not a straight out of camera thing. No, 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 no. Everything needs processing but they are much closer and they're better exposed. So even if I have to do a lot of processing, I've got that ability, right? So the, the mistakes that I see a lot of photographers making are number one, shooting everything on auto white balance. Um, as far as your raw file goes, that's fine. But what it's not helping you with in your display, your camera display, you're not getting a real sense of how do all these colors look and how do they look together. Likewise, if you're using one of those crazy color profiles in your camera, like Vivid, right? That means everything that you're seeing when you look through your mirrorless camera through the EVF or on, on your LCD, on your DSLR, everything you're seeing, the colors are juiced like crazy. So. You're not really seeing, and there, by the way, there's also additional contrast added into those vivid profiles, right? So you're not really seeing the relationships of the colors and the, the, the contrast relationships that are actually in your scene. So you're kind of getting this false version of what the picture is that you're taking. That's not helping you, right? Really what I strongly encourage you, your goal should be with the camera piece of this color management stuff is to keep your cameras as neutral as possible in your color workflow. And again, folks, like anything else, are there exceptions to this? Yes. I have a photographer in my mentoring program who does lots of events and step in repeats and shoots all that stuff in JPEGs. And that completely makes sense, right? That is a business model where time is money. You're not going to spend tons of time in post-processing. You get it right in the camera and you say goodbye to it after you shoot it. That's it. Done. Right? There's always going to be exceptions. There is no one size fits all here, folks. But for the majority of what most of you are doing, try to keep color management out of the camera. There is only one setting in, as far as color that I would encourage you to consider. And even then... Weigh it out personally, and then don't let anyone tell you you're making the wrong decision. And that is the decision of, do you shoot in Adobe RGB or do you shoot in sRGB? Adobe RGB, the only benefit, it's a slightly wider color gamut. What that means is it reflects, it uses a few more colors than sRGB does, okay? Pro Photo RGB, even a few more, but believe me, overwhelmingly, the majority of you do not need Pro Photo RGB. Even if you're printing your stuff, you do not need Pro Photo RGB. If you're doing a lot of really big printing, if you're doing a lot of really high end printing, in other words, if you've got images that are winning awards left and right, if you've got images that you're selling for thousands of dollars, you should probably be shooting Adobe RGB. Okay, because you're going to want a little bit more richness out of your color. In most cases, most, not all, we could take two images side by side, shoot it in sRGB, shoot it in Adobe RGB, and then go print a 36-inch print, a 48-inch print. And are you going to see the difference? In most cases, no. And if you do see a difference, the differences are going to be extremely subtle. Okay, so again, 
There's no one size fits all guaranteed thing, but most of you could absolutely get away with shooting sRGB. Full disclosure, I shoot Adobe RGB only because every now and then I do have an image that is going to be used for very high-end purposes. But that means in shooting Adobe RGB, I'm adding a step in post-production. That step is I need to convert all my files to sRGB before I put them on the internet. Otherwise, I risk the colors looking not so good because it's a different color space that we're working in, right? So in your cameras, you should be consistently shooting an sRGB or Adobe RGB. Your white balance, I encourage you to still pay attention to your white balance for the purpose of you having visual confirmation when you're shooting as to how your color relationships in your scene will look. For me, as a Sony shooter, I have everything on just standard, which is dialing in just ever so slight little, a little bit of, of color work, but that's it. A lot of photographers that I know who shoot Sony work in neutral, done. When I shot Olympus, I worked all in neutral. I liked to flatten the files out as much as possible so that I was seeing just what was going into the file. And then all my color work that I was doing in the back end it's subjective. It's, it's what do I want the colors to look like as a finished product, okay? Um, if you're shooting JPEGs, then of course, yes, you need to be paying a lot of attention to that color balance so that you, or the white balance, excuse me, so that you are getting the proper colors and the proper color relationships. But shooting raw, myself, I like to keep it pretty much as, as processed free as possible so that I'm seeing what the camera's seeing and what the camera's recording. That also lets me know then, okay, this is what I'm gonna have to work with when I get back to my computer and upload my files, okay? So again, if you're not doing this now, are you gonna run out, you're gonna buy this stuff right away? No. Should you watch that video from Autumn? Yes, actually, you should, okay? Um, and if you weren't thinking about this before last week, when I started talking about it, definitely do not run out and buy this stuff right now. What you need to be doing is doing a little bit more research. You need to be actually paying attention to what is your workflow with color. Ask yourself, are you processing your images properly? Now, what's properly, right? Remember, Joe doesn't like rules. Properly is, I promise you. Meaning, you're not going right to the exposure slider when your image is dark you're not going right to the contrast slider when you want a little bit more contrast in your image. You're not using a saturation slider above like a plus three or a plus four pretty much ever. If you're doing any one of those three things, you're not using your processing tools properly. And you're definitely not using them to your best advantage. So I would slow yourself down do a little bit more research, both in your post-processing, but also look at your full workflow from the camera. What settings are you using for white balance? What color space are you shooting in? Then when it comes to your computer, where you're doing your processing, are you managing the color on your computer? Are you sure that that display is giving you the best version of the color that you intended to give? Super, super important. So this is kind of one of those things, gang. Don't jump in, ease in. Do more research, ask more questions. If you're part of my Tog Knowledge community, obviously you can ask me questions there. You know, we can we can take it step at a time, but I, again, as part of this gear presentation I'm doing, I want you all to understand that these pieces are available and that they are things that you should at least be aware of, okay? All right, I had a question here, and guys, if you have questions, let me have them. I am going to finish up about five minutes early tonight. I'm doing a presentation in Canada, literally right after this, but uh, I've got time for questions. So let's get the questions in there, okay? Uh, Cooley asked here, um, what if you use a 50-inch TV monitor? Um, Cooley, I apologize. I don't know exactly when you typed that, but um, can if your question is, can you calibrate a 50-inch TV monitor if it has brightness, contrast and RGB settings, which most TVs do, then yes, you can. But I will tell you this, I would never consider retouching images on a 50 inch television. Um, 
for a bunch of reasons. Uh, first reason is resolution. Even if it's an 8K TV, it doesn't come anywhere near the clarity and sharpness and detail of my MacBook or my Apple Studio display. That's number one. Number two, um, the way contrast ranges work on televisions is frequently very different than it is on computer monitors. So a, a monitor is not a TV and a TV is not a monitor. Yes, you can hook a TV up to a computer and, and vice versa, but they're not the same thing. They work in, in different ways. Um, but the, the big thing for me, you know, I, I spend, I don't know about you, but I spent a lot of money for my megapixels. I want to see a sharp image, even when I'm working on it, right? I don't want to imagine that it's going to look sharper when I'm done. So, um, yeah, could you create a profile for a TV? Sure, you could. But I would actually discourage you from doing your post-processing on a TV. Maybe doing your retouching, possibly, right? But when you're doing your actual processing, the developing of your images, where you're working on the color and the contrast and all of that, uh, I absolutely would not do that on a TV. Do it on a monitor, sure, but not on a TV. And, and there's definitely um, definitely a big difference there, okay? Uh, so let's see, I'm just scrolling. Uh, wow, guys, you're making this easy on me. So we well, got no other questions. Am I ending early tonight? Are you guys like good to go with your, your color science and everything? Oh, here, I promised I would share that link. Did I share the link? Uh, I did. Okay. So yeah, you guys have the link there for, for Autumn's video. By all means, uh, feel free to check that out. Um, next week, we're going to take a week off from gear because I'm not going to lie. Like this gear stuff, stressful for me. Because, uh, you know, gear's not my thing, right? It's like, but yeah. So I, I, have, a, I have a topic coming up. Uh, I'm not going to tell you what it is tonight. Uh, I'm going to let that tease out a little bit, but there's some cool stuff happening that we're going to get into next week that I think is something that's actually really important for a lot of you to be considering. Uh, and then we'll come back to the gear and the next gear conversation, by the way, um, it's going to be another probably two parter. I don't think we're going to be able to get it through all in one. And that is going to be modifiers. Okay. Uh, Peter, how much is the aging of a monitor a factor in color critical workflow and calibration. So uh, interesting that you worded the question that way, Peter, right? Uh, I'm going to take it backwards. You talk about color critical workflow. Um, I don't know anybody with a color critical workflow, and I seriously doubt there's anybody listening to me or watching this video that has a color critical workflow. I sure as hell don't. Okay, so l let's just make sure we're clarifying some of the words along the way, right? As far as the aging of a monitor, yes, monitors as they age, um, even you know um, LED monitors, etc., will tend to lose contrast a little bit. There can be slight color shifts, but that's why you color calibrate, right? Uh, certainly, they'll reach a point where they're at, they're basically out of bounds, and the calibration software is going to let you know, like, hey, we can't we can't meet the parameters at this point. Okay. Um, this was a much bigger problem back in the days of, you know, CRT monitors, right. Which were basically the big tubes because they would, you know, burn a screen image in much easier, which you can still do on modern monitors, right. It's just, it's a lot harder. Um, and they would fade a lot faster. So, um, all the more reason for using calibration software to make sure that you've got that consistency throughout. So, um, yeah, but in terms of the color critical thing, I, I can't stress it enough to go back to where I was before. I honestly don't think there's a single person that's going to watch this video that needs a color critical workflow. Uh, and a key word in that sentence was need followed by a critical, right? Uh, I don't need it. So, uh, you know, again, most of what most of us shoot, us, all of us listening, it's subjective. Um, there are not a whole lot of us that, and, and you're going to see perfect example is the video from data color with autumn where she does that scene, um, doing all the calibration work she does certainly doesn't hurt it, but it doesn't make the picture either because she winds up saturating it in the end. Okay. So, uh, Ben should a 100% Adobe monitor be set to sRGB 
uh, if the rest of your process is also using sRGB color space. Um, I'm not sure what you mean, Ben, by a 100% Adobe monitor. To the best of my knowledge, Adobe doesn't make monitors. Um, so I'm not sure exactly what you mean. Give me a little bit more information there. Um, if you're asking, should your color profile for your monitor be set to sRGB if you're doing sRGB for everything else? No, you should be color calibrating it and using that as your um, profile. But uh, type fast, give me a little bit more information because I don't have any other questions. So, um, and I will, since I have a presentation coming up, I'll, I'll bail a little bit early. Um, okay, so your monitor is 100% RG, Adobe RGB capable. No, just because it's capable doesn't mean you should do it. But the point is, you're, you're, not, you're not going to select sRGB or Adobe RGB for your monitor, then you're going to run a calibration with a calibrator, whether you use the data color like I'm showing, or use an X-Rite, whatever you choose, and you are going to set that as your profile, okay? Um, sRGB and RGB are color spaces. They are not color profiles. And this is, you know, again, where it all gets confusing, right? So because there's camera profiles and, you know, you got profiles that when you start talking with monitors and that, but sRGB, RGB are color spaces or color gamuts. That's not a profile. And yes, on a lot of computers, if you look in the profiles, there is like an sRGB profile. Uh, and that, But no, that's not what you're going to use. So, um, Ashwani, when you run the calibration, should you tell it to calibrate to sRGB? Uh, if you're running like data color, you don't you don't have to. Um, so it it's not going to it's not going to set it that way. Cooley, what about color profile on printers? Um, yeah, if you're doing your own printing, I would encourage you uh, work with um, uh, like data color, for instance. They'll they go all the way through and allow you to profile your printers uh, the whole bit. I do so little printing, I don't worry about that, but is it worth it? Absolutely, okay? Um, even from the standpoint that, you know, in Lightroom and Photoshop, you can do soft proofing, which is, going, if you're doing your own printing, soft proofing is gonna allow you to basically dial in uh, the types of inks and papers that you're using so that you can get a visual representation of how is this image going to reproduce, um, but still working with a color profile is going to help you kind of control that consistency all the way through. Um, I would tell you though, um, straight up, I I wouldn't I wouldn't invest it. And I know this will some photographers will terribly disagree with this, and that's okay. Uh, but for me, I would not invest the time and effort and bandwidth into um, profiling printers and that, unless you are going to use something like the spiders where you are also monitoring the ambient light in your room when you create your profiles. Uh, otherwise, you're, you're kind of calibrating against an artificial target because if you're one of those folks that likes to do all of your post-processing in a dimly lit room or more like a dark room, um, you're just making it really, really hard to get the proper brightness out of your prints, which means that all this color profiling you're doing, it's great by the numbers, but you're still going to screw it up with how light or how dark your files are. So, you know, sure, if you're going to make sure that you're following all those steps and you're really managing both your ambient light in your space, as well as what you're doing with your monitors, then yes, if you do quite a bit of printing, yeah, I mean, I, and this is a whole separate topic, right? Um, I'll be the first to say it's really unfortunate that we don't do enough, do more printing in our industry. Now, on the flip side, I'm one of the ones that's guilty of that. I don't print near as much as I should print. Um, so, you know, for me, there's not enough of a demand for that. There, there just isn't. Um, in fact, I will, you know, be the first to admit like this time of year, every year, 
I will do some printing for Christmas gifts. Um, like last year, I'm going to do it again. This year, my oldest grandson who plays baseball, I put together a, a photo book of his season. So last year, his team won the championship. So it was a book called The Championship Season. This year, it's all about faces because he makes lots of crazy faces when he's playing baseball. Uh, and I've literally got hundreds of images of him, you know, and, and all of his different faces. So, um, you know, I, I will go through a printing process, but will, uh, you know, I print it myself, number one, no. Um, will I download the profiles from the lab that I'm using? Yes. Um, and that's kind of a whole secondary conversation, but that's not gear. That's more of a workflow thing where we could talk about printer profiles and how to do that. And I'll, I'll gladly bring that up down the road. Um, but I don't want to go too deep into that tonight. We're just going to confuse the heck out of people. So, um, from Ron, would there be any issues with purchasing an older spider like the spider five besides maybe speed? Uh, I don't think that they work the same way as computers do. I don't think it's a processor thing, Ron. Um, the potential issue is simply go to the data color support page and see if the software that runs the Spider 5, because it's probably not going to be the same software that runs the Elite, the X Elite or the Pro, um, see if that software will run on your computer. Um, in all likelihood, like if you're running like an M1 Mac like I am, I'd be willing to bet you it's probably not going to run. So it, it's got nothing to do with speed. It's simply got to do with the software that runs it and the computer and operating system that you're using. So those are the things you're gonna check. And Data Color has a great support section. All that stuff is on their support section. I will tell you straight up, uh, their support section is a little hard to find. So the trick is, it's really simple. Here, let me go back to the browser. When you go to the website, go all the way to the bottom and um, contact support. Like it's really kind of hidden, but now they have this great section. So you can type in, um, let's see, what did you ask about Spider 5? So uh, Spider 5, eh, whoops. Let's try that one more time. Spider 5. Let's see what it's going to tell us. So, yeah. So there you go. Actually, they're saying that you can get it to work on M1. They've got some other stuff there, but but that's what you want to check. Um, so it it's not going to be uh, it's not going to be a speed issue in in the sense of like it is with computers or things like that. Um, but I would definitely check it before you find it. And I'll be honest with you, I have absolutely no idea what's the difference. So I would also do a feature by feature comparison just in terms of like, okay, what am I missing, um, you know, with, with the Spider 5 compared to what I would be missing with, um, you know, an X Pro or an NX Elite, okay? All right, let's see here. Uh, and another question from Ashwani. Uh, Display Cal is a free open source calibration software that's compatible with a lot of older instruments. You know, uh, Ashwani, I've heard of that. I've never used it. I've, I haven't read a lot about it, but I have heard people talk about it. So yeah, I, thank you for that recommendation. And, and folks, so Ron, even looking at the older one, that's something that, you know, that you might want to consider. And again, I guess my final words here again, because I am going to have to sign off, like I said, a few minutes early tonight. The, the thing that I want to impress on all of you, right? Don't get so deep in the weeds with this that it takes all the fun out of your photography because most of you really don't need to. I wanted to deal with this topic at this point in the gear conversations because lately I've run into a lot of photographers, quite a few that are in my mentoring group who have gotten themselves in the weeds with all this color management stuff and have just completely gotten themselves confused between color spaces and color profiles and then color management and the color in a JPEG compared to color in a raw file. And they're stressed and their colors all over the place and they're basically making life a lot harder. So again, I'm sorry for sounding like a broken record, but the idea here is simplify. Make sure that you're color managing your monitors if you're able to afford that and at least you know you've got a baseline. So when you take those files out of your camera and put them on the computer, 
You're seeing things the way that they should be seen with the proper color and contrast and everything else. So that when you do your processing and send it out to the world, you stand a much better likelihood that the rest of the world is going to see it the way you intended. Okay? Uh, but I promise you, I, you know, you don't need to get deep in the weeds. I don't get deep in the weeds at all. Anytime I can avoid doing that extra weeds work, trust me, I'm, I'm not doing it. I'm going to keep it as simple as possible. And that's the beauty of most of the work that I do. All of it is subjective. There's no correct that anybody can compare it to. It's, it's my version, right? So anyway, gang, thank you so much. I'm out of time. Uh, hopefully you found a little bit of value in this tonight. I, I purposely, again, I'm trying to keep it kind of 50,000 foot level. It's something that I want you to start being aware of and start learning about, but don't run out and buy if you haven't already had the need, right? And remember, you're not getting any younger. That means you have less time than you did yesterday to shoot. So go pick up your camera and shoot something because your best shot, it's your next shot. Adios, gang. Take care.